The Rise and Fall of the Ford Pinto The 70s and 80s represent a period known for some rather awesome cars, most of which persist to this day. However, not all cars from that age managed to transition into classics. If you're old enough, you just might remember the Ford Pinto, which was all the rage at a point in history. If not, strap in for one of the most riveting tales about a car you will ever hear. So first off, what led to the birth of the Ford Pinto? Well, the conception of the car was very much a product of the times. See, at the time, native car manufacturers like Ford were losing sales to superior foreign imports from Germany and Japan. Those vehicles were slimmer and cheaper, unlike the bulky and expensive American alternatives. Lee Iacocca was the president of the Ford Motor Company at the time. As such, he ordered his engineers to make a new, sleek, subcompact car to compete with these foreign imports. He wanted the car to weigh no more than 2,000 pounds. In addition, he didn't want it to cost more than $2,000. He was a man with a vision, and he couldn't keep letting these foreign competitors beat his company at their own game. Well, unfortunately, this unwavering vision may have been where the trouble began. There was a good reason why the Ford Pinto was Ford's first ever subcompact car. There's also a good reason why subcompact cars were quite popular at the time. See, during the late 60s and early 70s, America was going through a rather harsh gas shortage crisis. As such, large cars which needed more gas to run were becoming quite unaffordable to the average American. In contrast, these subcompact cars from Japan and Germany didn't need that much fuel to go great distances. Also, they were cheaper to buy. The reason why Ford had yet to make a subcompact car of this nature is that the technology they had on hand just hadn't caught up to that kind of car concept. With their bulky cars, it was difficult enough to fit everything in the engine while keeping it smoothly running. Making their cars smaller than they were sounded like a nightmare to the engineers, but competitors were getting it done, and so, why couldn't they? Ford had always been regarded as an industry leader. At a time when many thought the eight-cylinder engine to be an impossibility, the company succeeded in making one. It was this sort of attitude that led them to try for the subcompact car. Robert Eidschen was selected to be the mastermind behind the Pinto's design. Despite all the technical challenges that making a subcompact car presented, Ford engineers were somehow able to get the job done. Though the automotive industry standard was 43 months for development, Ford engineers, no doubt under pressure from upper management, managed to get the car ready in 25 months. This was the shortest production schedule in automotive history at the time. On September 11, 1970, Ford introduced the Pinto under the tagline, The Little Carefree Car. Where sales were concerned, the Ford Pinto was relatively a success. By January of the following year, it had sold 100,000 units. Between the years 1971 to 1989, the Pinto sold 3,173,491. 1974 was a particularly successful year, seeing 544,209 units sold, which was the peak number of sales attained during any of the years that the Pinto was active. The Pinto was designed in 10 different models. It was a pretty ubiquitous car, which you could find on many streets and in many parking lots. By all accounts, Ford Motor President had achieved his vision, right up until the trouble began. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't just one incident that led to the downfall of the Pinto, rather, it took many. A car crash here, a spontaneous fire there, on and on and on. Anyone paying attention would have been able to see the signs. Unfortunately for Ford, some people were paying attention. Some rather resilient journalists who were wondering where coincidences ended and where causality and correlation began. A couple of landmark investigative news reports on the Ford Pinto's problems were released. This was the beginning of the Pinto's change in reputation from America's best car to America's death trap. One of the key pieces was a 1973 cost-benefit analysis paper called Fatalities Associated with Crash-Induced Fuel Leakage and Fires submitted to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration NHTSA. The paper alleged that Ford's safety engineers had come to the conclusion that it simply would not be worth the cost for them to increase the car's safety profile. All it would have taken to make the car safe was $11 per car. 
Apparently, upper management had been unwilling to part with that figure. The fact that the cars had a reduced safety profile meant that they were ridiculously prone to combustion. The littlest impact in the rear could cascade into a full-blown fire, and the way the car was designed, being subcompact, it was difficult to escape once it started to burn. This is what inspired some media outlets to brand the car a death trap. And so, instead of increasing the cost per unit of production for the Pinto, Ford Motor executives decided to save their money to instead pay for any lawsuits or grievances filed against them. If the cars didn't get into accidents, then they would have saved money. It was a logical cost-benefit analysis. However, the cost in question was human life, and as such, this decision didn't go down well with the public at all. So much so that journalists had more of an incentive to demonize Ford. In another article published by the Mother Jones magazine called Pinto Madness, the writer behind this piece capitalized on outrage at Ford to exaggerate some of the facts behind the failure of the Pinto. They stated that there were 500 to 900 deaths, while the actual figure estimated 180 burn-related deaths and 180 injuries. Aside from these landmark papers, there were so many other news reports which were released concerning Ford and their blatant disregard for consumer safety. In any case, these news pieces were the least of the company's troubles. There were a couple of huge lawsuits that had been filed against the company. These were costing them much more money than they had initially anticipated. One of the huge cases was Grimshaw v. Ford Motor Company in 1981. After Lily Gray's Pinto was rear-ended by another car while driving on the freeway, the result was a gas leak, which quickly ignited into a fire and then an explosion. Gray failed to make it, but 13-year-old Richard Grimshaw survived, suffering horrific burns which took several surgical procedures to treat. Grimshaw and Gray's family took Ford to court, and the jury awarded not only $2.516 million to the Grimshaws, and $559,680 to the Grays in damages for their injuries, but also $125 million to punish Ford for its conduct. Ford appealed the judgment, and the court reduced the award of punitive damages to $3.5 million. As a matter of fact, Ford tried to have the entire case dismissed. However, the court ignored the motion, deciding that Ford had done so much to endanger its users' lives. Ford got into many other lawsuits of this nature, including one which claimed the lives of three young girls from Indiana. This saw the entire state file open a case against them. Damages were paid to all the victims after a lengthy legal battle in which Ford tried to minimize their culpability. In any case, the result of this faultiness resulted in Ford having to withdraw 1.5 million Ford Pinto cars. This incident remains one of the largest cases of product withdrawals from the market in history. It was an embarrassment for Ford, and it took years for them to regain consumer trust. In retrospect, it turns out that Ford's subcompact vehicles weren't the only faulty subcompact vehicles on the market. Those of both local and foreign competitors were equally, if not more so, as faulty. The media just decided to make a scapegoat of Ford because they were a huge company that everyone liked to read about. The truth was that the concept of the subcompact vehicle was a little ahead of the times. Do you know anyone who owned a Ford Pinto? What was their experience with the car? Inasmuch as this model of car served many people well, this entire experience should hopefully serve as a cautionary tale for executives and engineers against cutting corners during production. Coming to the end of this video, we hope you appreciate the tumultuous journey that the Ford Pinto took throughout the course of its history. It might not be fit for driving anymore, but there are good arguments as to why it could be preserved in a museum. If you liked this video, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share. Our content is always interesting and engaging, and you sure wouldn't want to miss out. Till next time, have a good day. Catch you later!